Bournemouth University and the We're Supporting Time to Change Let's End Mental Health Discrimination logos are shown. Text on screen reads, Depression, Signs, Symptoms and Support, Sue Forber, Depression Alliance. Followed by, this video is part of the Equality and Diversity Outreach work being undertaken at BU. The screen is split into four areas. The title at the bottom, Mental Health Awareness Week 2014, logos at the top including Bournemouth University Dorset Mental Health Forum, Dorset Healthcare NHS University NHS Foundation Trust, Richmond Fellowship, Boroughofpool.com and Depression Alliance. Then we have the slides on the left and the speaker on the right. Slide 1 reads, Depression, Signs, Symptoms and Support, a World Mental Health Week presentation to Bournemouth University, 9th October 2014. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, my name is Sue Forber. I work for Depression Alliance, which is a national charity for people affected by depression. And as Andy said, I used to work for Dorset Mental Health Forum, who I'll be mentioning later in my talk. I should have been doing this talk with a colleague from the Mental Health Forum, Jane Carey. Unfortunately, Jane couldn't be here today. She's had a family bereavement, so she sends her apologies. Um, I really want to congratulate the uni on holding this fantastic week of events. I think it's really encouraging. It would, if I was being a student again, it would certainly make me want to come to this uni. I know that much. Um, if you would like a copy of the slides, I'm very happy to email them to anyone that wants them. I've put my card on the table over there, which has got my email address on it. So just drop me a line if you'd like the slides and I'll send them across to you. So depression is obviously an emotive subject and I won't be the only person in this room who's experienced depression. If something that I touch on just makes you feel a bit wobbly or vulnerable, please feel free to do what you need to do to, to feel better, whether that's leaving the room, just you know, um, standing at the back for a while. Um, it's absolutely fine. I will be touching on suicide, and again, I won't be the only person in the room who's been affected by suicide, so please just feel free to look after <laughs> yourself. And I will hang around at the end if anyone wants to talk to me one-to-one. -one. So, I don't have a clicker, so I have to... The slide changes to a picture that shows a person holding a card that says I'm fine. In between the lines crossed out the words depressed, sad, hurt, confused, lonely, unloved, judged, misunderstood, insignificant, broken, dying inside. Keep doing this. Um, don't know if any of you can identify with this. Um, I think one of the things about depression is often it's hidden. You can't necessarily tell if somebody has depression. And I know um, I've experienced depression on and off throughout my adult life, and I'm very good at doing that smile. You just see the smiley face at the top. And that, that was me, you know, I was very good at hiding and wearing a mask. And wearing a mask is, you know, we do that for all sorts of reasons, partly because of the stigma of mental health issues that still persist. But also I think sometimes we do it to keep our own negative emotions away from ourselves. It's a way of trying to kind of keep them at bay. But you can't do that for too long. You know, they will always catch up with you in the end. Um, and it, you know, it, I've learned really through the years that actually we all have times when things in our lives make us feel very, very sad, very upset. And we need to feel that, you know, and it is okay to feel that and the feelings do go away. So learning to just feel how we feel is, has been really important for me. Um, so masks, yeah, we do wear them, but I, I know for me it, it was a huge sense of relief when I just gave up wearing that mask and just thought, no, I am going to be myself and I'm going to be, you know, sad at some times, but that's okay. Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. So some facts and figures about depression first. Um, it's very common. The most common mental health condition is mixed anxiety and depression. They, they often go together. Um, but about one in five of us will be affected by depression. I did a quick count of the room and I think there's about 30 of us here. So that's, you know, that's six of us in our lifetime. We will, we will know what it's like to feel depression. Now, women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with depression, 
But that doesn't mean to say that women suffer twice as much depression. I think it's much harder for men to ask for help. You know, men, boys are socialized to be strong, not to show vulnerabilities. And it's much harder, I think, for men to, to be open. Um, and, and sadly, the way that you know depression in men can manifest itself is if you look at the suicide rate, three quarters of suicides are, are men, um, which is um, you know something that we should all be trying to do something about. Um, in 2012, we had nearly 6,000 suicides in the UK, and 77% of them were were men. And indeed, suicide is the single biggest killer of men under 35 in the UK. So that's a, quite a startling figure. And actually, if you if you bring it down to a to a younger age group, if you look at 20 to 24 year olds, there were five male suicides for every female suicide in 2012. So it becomes a real issue for young men, and I'll be, I'll be just mentioning that again in a little while. Slide changes, content of it by the speaker. However, the, the important positive news is that 80% of us will make a full recovery from depression within four to six months, and that is whether or not you get any treatment. <laughs> so it tends to be quite a self-limiting condition, and obviously there are all sorts of different treatments and support and help available which I'll be talking about. But even if you don't go anywhere near a mental health service or your GP and you just kind of battle on through it, chances are you will make a full recovery. So that's really important to note. However, that, I don't want you to think that means you shouldn't bother to ask for help, because why suffer needlessly? You know, there are lots of ways to treat depression which mean that you can make it a much shorter episode than it would otherwise be. So 80% of people will make a full recovery, but that leaves 20%. And 20, those 20% will are likely to still be depressed two years later, which is an awful long time to be really struggling. There are all sorts of different kinds of help, support, treatment these days. It used to be, and I think in some areas of the country it is still the case, that you'll get offered antidepressant, antidepressants very, very quickly if you go and see a GP. I, um, I have taken antidepressants on and off through my life. And I would never say to anyone, don't try them. I, I found it very difficult to manage the side effects. And, and that's true of a lot of kind of psycho psychiatric drugs, that sometimes the, the side effects are, are worse than the actual symptoms. And I had to try three different kinds of antidepressant until I found one that really worked for me. But these days, when you go to your GP and you're diagnosed with depression, the first line of treatment is supposed to be a talking therapy. So rather than give you drugs, they're supposed to start by offering you a talking treatment. So that might be counselling, or more likely it might be cognitive behaviour therapy, um, which has got a really strong evidence base. So that's what will happen. But outside of kind of the NHS, there's all sorts of other ways that you can treat and alleviate depression. And one of the best things for me is, has actually been peer support. It's actually been the support of other people who know what it's like to go through depression and who can help and encourage you and remind you that this isn't going to last forever. You will get better and just give you that support without you having to kind of tell your whole story over and over again because they know, they know what it feels like. And I'll be coming back to peer support a bit later. I've talked about meditation. <coughs> Exercise is really important as well as uh, for mild to moderate depression. Um, moderate exercise is as effective as taking antidepressants. It doesn't mean you have to sign up and run a marathon. It can just be walking. It can be doing some gardening. It can be playing out in the in the fields with your kids. It it can be a whole raft of things, but it's. It's, a, it's as important um, to think about your physical health and how that can help your mental health. And then ecotherapy, that's um, 
a bit of a jargon word really, but it's about kind of using the outdoors as, as therapy. So it can be gardening, it can be hiking, it could be um, anything that takes you out into nature. Um, and that again has, has got a growing evidence base that that does really work for depression. Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. Obviously we're here at the uni, so I wanted to focus in on students and depression. And the NUS did some research last year, and an incredible 92% of that survey respondents had experienced mental distress. Where only 20% considered that they had a mental health problem. So there's no quite a nice distinction there between saying, yes, I've experienced mental distress, but it doesn't necessarily mean I see myself as having some sort of ongoing mental health problem. 13% had had suicidal thoughts. And as you would expect, the main causes of distress amongst students are, are coursework, exams, which obviously can be a very anxious time, and financial difficulties. I was lucky enough to go to uni when we had such things as grants, and I didn't have to pay tuition fees and so on. And I really admire you, you guys here who are students um, for having to get yourselves into debt to, to pursue higher education. I think, you know, it's, times have really changed. Exactly, you know, over 25% of those students hadn't told anyone about their, their mental distress. And if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from today, really, it, it is that please talk to each other. It's okay to talk about mental health. You don't have to be an expert. You can make a difference just by asking someone how they are. You know, it's really not rocket science. Slide changes, content of the speaker. <clears throat> Continuing on the student theme, between 2007 and 2011, the number of students who took their own lives actually rose by 50%, so quite a startling number. And that was even though the whole student body had only risen by 14%. So clearly the last few years have been a real challenge for some students. And it's another good reason why universities like Bournemouth are, take, are trying to really take care of students. And then the Priory Group, which is a private mental health provider, did some research at the start of this year with students. And they found that 43% of first year students just didn't feel comfortable talking to another student about mental health. It just wasn't something that they felt would, would be acceptable. Um, and in the third year, almost three quarters of the students had been diagnosed with depression that they talked to. So it is a huge issue and it's, it's really important that um, both students and staff and universities as, as a whole take it seriously, just like Bournemouth is doing. Slide changes, content are by the speaker. So what are the signs and symptoms of depression? So this is, a, this is the way that a doctor will diagnose depression. So it's not a case that, you know, we use the word depression very loosely. We say, oh, I'm really depressed because my parcel from Amazon didn't turn up. What am I going to do? You know, that isn't depression, but we use it in that, you know, we use that term very loosely. But the way that a doctor will diagnose clinical depression is that you need to have five or more of these symptoms and they have to have lasted at least two weeks. So the first one is that you are feeling low or sad for most of the day and for most days. And that you've lost interest and pleasure in things. And I know when, when I get episodes of depression, you know, I really notice that things that I love doing, I just I just have no interest in doing anymore and I feel very, very unmotivated really to, to do anything. Um, decreased energy or increased fatigue and that, that can go along with having sleep problems which I'll come to in a minute. Loss of confidence or self-esteem. Um, when I'm very low, I, I feel that I have to withdraw from other people because otherwise I will be inflicting myself on them. I feel like 
I'm really bad company and I must just keep away from everyone because I'm just not a good person to be around. So I, I sort of withdraw myself and that can become a, a vicious circle. Feeling guilty about things that I have done or I haven't done and just feeling not, not good about myself, feeling like I'm not a good person. And um, recurrent suicidal thoughts or acts. Sometimes you'll hear people saying, oh, people that talk about suicide, they don't do it. That, that is not true. Um, a lot of people who talk about suicide and express suicidal thoughts will go on to attempt or in, indeed um, complete suicide. So please do take it seriously if anyone tells you that they're feeling suicidal. We have a fantastic service in this country, the Samaritans, and I know Andy's very involved with the Samaritans here in Bournemouth, aren't you? So um, there's, there's the phone line, there's obviously your GP, there's the um, University Health Centre here, but please take su suicidal um, talk seriously if you come across it. Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. <clears throat> Other signs and symptoms are poor concentration or slow thinking and I know that when I first became very depressed I, I really just thought I was completely going mad because I couldn't, I couldn't string a sentence together and I couldn't get my thoughts into order but that is a symptom of depression. Um, either agitation or slowing of movement or speech um, so some people do become, they're very restless, they can't settle, they're moving around a lot. Other people will just slow right down and I know again for myself, I will be very slow, I will walk very slowly, talk very slowly. Disturbed, disturbed sleep and disturbed appetite, they can go either way. Some people will sleep as much as they possibly can but when they wake up they'll still feel totally exhausted. Other people won't be able to sleep and they'll be lying awake in the middle of the night churning thoughts over and over in their head. And the same with appetite, some people will comfort eat, some people will have no appetite and they'll start to lose weight. And so you can see that quite a lot of symptoms of depression are also symptoms of, of physical conditions and, and sometimes it will really surprise someone to be told actually you've got depression because the symptoms can be so physical. Um, and the last one there is very, very rare, but there is a condition called psychotic depression, where people will lose contact with reality, they'll have delusions or hallucinations, but as I say, that is extremely rare. Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. So that's all the kind of the, the signs and symptoms, but it is really important to come back to the fact that it's normal to recover. And I don't think we hear that enough, you know, I don't think we tell other people that enough. You will recover, you will have, you know, there is hope. So just hang on to that thought as well. And then if you can ever, ever help a friend who's feeling <coughs> depressed, you can just remember to say to them that, you know, you will recover and I know you're going to recover. I really believe it because they may not feel that themselves. Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. Now at this point of the talk, if Jane was here, she was going to tell you about her own experience. Um, because she's not here today, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what happened to me and um, what, what's kind of come out of it. I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I went to uni, I went to Southampton University in the 80s. I um, was a kind of, you know, very academic person. I did a master's degree and then I kind of launched myself into a career. And um, through my student days, I did have episodes of feeling very low. I did have glandular fever, which didn't help because that kind of took a chunk out of my um, first degree um, and I missed quite a lot of work but I um, I just kind of muddled on through it and um, came out and did my master's, went into work but I, um, I was one of those people that really um, thought that it was important to have a kind of career ladder and work your way up the ladder and I um, that's what I did and it was 
it was difficult because I had these periods where I felt very negative about myself more than anything. Um, but I carried on because I thought that's what you needed to do. Um, until I couldn't, and I did wear the mask and the smiley face and do all the, you know, be really efficient at everything, and very perfectionist, which I'm working on, I'm trying to not be a perfectionist anymore. Um, but what happened to me that kind of stopped it all was that I had the sort of worst episode when I just got married, I just moved to a new job of promotion, and we'd moved house. And so on paper, you would say, what on earth has this woman got to be depressed about? She's got this fantastic job, she's got married, she lives in this lovely country cottage. And I stood in the kitchen of that country cottage saying to my new husband, I want to die, I just want to die. Um, I left him, I left him after seven months of marriage because I felt that I was ruining his life and I thought he should have a normal person in his life, so I said, no, no, you know, we, we need to separate. I left our lovely home. I was off sick for a year. I was working in local government at the time in a social services department. And I tried to go back to work at the end of that year because I needed the money. My sick pay ran out, basically. Um, but within two weeks, I was off sick again. My doctor and my mental health worker had said to me, you're not, you're not well enough to go back, but I you know, was determined to try, but it didn't work. Um, and so during that, that year, that 18 months, I, I lost my home, my marriage, and my career. Um, and it was tough. I, I spent most of that year under the duvet. I rarely went out. I didn't answer the door to people, I rarely answered the phone to people. And I look back now and I just think how hideous it must have been for my husband and my family and my friends. Um, but that, that is what it was like. Gradually, gradually, gradually I started to feel better. I was getting help, I was on medication, I was getting counselling and I had friends. I was living with a friend who had had depression herself, so she knew what it was like. And I gradually came back into the light of day. Um, the, the hardest bit um, was, was the loss of confidence. I, although I felt better in myself, I just felt like, well, I'm a write-off. You know, uh, my job had been, my contract had been terminated on the grounds of incapacity. And just that phrase just made me feel like I was this officially incapable person. So the idea of trying to get back into work was really, really daunting. I was very, very lucky that my husband had stayed in the background, being my friend, supporting me through this, and we got back together, which was the, the best thing, the best thing that happened. Um, and we had a little boy who was 15 on Monday, which I can't believe, I can't believe he's 15. Um, but I was, although all of that side of my life really kind of turned around, I was still just terrified of the idea of trying to work again. And one of the things that I get very cross about with the current government is this obsession that everyone needs to get back to work. There is evidence to show that if that work can be good for our mental health, but it has to be the right job, the right employer, and the right support. And sadly, often work is a cause of people's mental health problems. So, you know, it's not straightforward to just say everyone needs to get back to work. I wanted to get back to work because I was, you know, I had had a successful career, but I just thought I'll never, I'll never get back there. And one day in our local paper, I saw an advert for a job once a fortnight on a Saturday, um, working in a cafe in a mental health clubhouse, which is a kind of peer-led, user-led uh, model of a kind of social club for people with mental health problems. <coughs> and in the advert, it said, personal experience of mental health problems will be considered an asset. And I read this and I thought, well, you don't see that in many job adverts. And once every fortnight on a Saturday, my husband can look after my son. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. Just dip my toe back in the water. And I was lucky enough to get that job. And 
That job led to another job within Dorset Mental Health Forum. I ended up as a senior manager in Dorset Mental Health Forum and now work for Depression Alliance, working on a national project, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And so my life has really turned around and I re you know, I'm very, very grateful for what happened to me. Um, depression has made me a better person. I think I'm a lot kinder, more compassionate, more thoughtful about other people. I'm not on that kind of, I must do well, I must achieve <laughs> treadmill. I realised that I was trying to make my dad proud of me by having that career ladder thing, but my dad was dead, so he was never going to say to me, well done, Sue. But that, unconsciously, that's what I was trying to do, is to make him proud of me. So I was forced to stop and change, but it was the best thing that could have happened to me. And now I'm lucky enough to be doing this job, and I, I love my job. I uh, just feel so fortunate. And, you know, it's shown me that there is always hope. You know, when I was at my lowest, I just wouldn't have believed if, if someone had said to me, in 15 years' time, you'll be talking at Bournemouth Uni about depression and about hope and recovery. And here I am. So if, if you know anyone that's in despair through depression, just say to them, there is hope, and I will hope for you, even if you can't hope for yourself. Slide changes. Um, support, then, for... Um, for depression. Um, as I mentioned, I work for Depression Alliance, um, the leading charity in this country for people affected by depression. There's other mental health charities as well, <laughs> I should mention. So obviously MIND is, is the largest mental health charity, um, and they've got a really good website, lots of really good downloadable publications and so on, so give them a mention. Um, Friends in Need, I'm going to talk about in a minute, but that's the project that I work on with Depression Alliance, and I'm hoping to get some of you interested in that in, in a second. Samaritans, I've mentioned, really important. They are a lifesaver. And it is important to say, although I mention them in the context of suicide, you don't have to be feeling suicidal to ring them. You really don't, and that's a bit of a, bit of a myth. So they're just a listening ear, whatever's going on in your life. Calm, a campaign against living miserably. Um, that's a um, charitable organisation which is aimed at men, and they're really worth looking at. They have a fantastic website. And um, by the way, I have got a resources thing that I can email you as well with all of the kind of URLs and everything for all these organisations if you want it. But they run a, a, a thing called the Calm Zone, which is from 5 till midnight every day, and it's a phone line. So again, aimed at young... They started off being aimed at young men, but they've kind of broadened it out to men of any age. But they're a really good organisation. Student Minds um, is a national peer-led organisation. Um, they're, they're worth having a look on their website. And then there's Students Against Depression, which is a bit smaller, but they do have a presence on some uni campuses. Um, but they've got just some really good advice for students who are, who are struggling. And Times Change, you've got your fantastic banners there. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been involved with Times Change since the start, which is eight years ago now. And, um, I'm really, really pleased that the Students' Union here is going to be signing the Times Change Pledge tomorrow. I would have loved to be here for that, and unfortunately I was invited, but unfortunately I can't be here tomorrow. But it is really important to challenge stigma and discrimination, and you don't have to be you know, wielding a placard to do that. It's as simple as just talking about mental health and talking about emotions as a starting point. And I have got some little cards on the table that are from time to change. Um, Slide changes, contents are read by the speaker. Friends in Need. Um, so this is the project that I work on for Depression Alliance. And it's a peer support community. Um, we have a website, but it's not all about being online. You can chat to people online at any time of day or night. It's a fully moderated site, so it is a safe space. 
You can be completely anonymous, you can create a username and an avatar, or you can just be yourself, it's entirely up to you. But you can talk to other people who know what it's like to be struggling with depression. But it doesn't end there. What we're trying to do with Friends in Need is encourage people to set up groups and meetups to just do social stuff, so have a coffee together, go and see a film, go to a gig, but just with a group of friends who know what it's like to feel depressed. So you don't have to explain why you might be a bit quiet or why you might want to leave halfway through because you've just had enough because your energy levels are really low. And I'd love if any of you here today wanted to get a group going here on the campus, and I would help you to do that. Um, I live in Dorset and I work from home in Dorset, so it's no trouble to me to come and work with you to get a Friends in Need group off the ground. Over on the table I've got flyers and I've got wristbands, like this. Um, please do take them and if any of you would like to think about doing something on campus, if you see me at the end or drop me an email, I'd be really delighted. Um, again, if Jane was here, she would talk about the Dorset Mental Health Forum, which is very close to my heart because they were so much a part of my recovery. Um, but they are a Dorset-wide charity run by and for people with mental health problems. And they've got a display stand in the reception area today here on the campus, so worth going to see them if you can. Um, but they run all sorts of different um, activities, um, different ways of supporting people. And they're part of the Recovery Education Centre, which is, is like a virtual college. Anyone can go on their courses, they're free of charge, but they're all about mental health, well-being, how to look after yourself, well-being toolkits, and, you know, fantastic stuff they do, so they're really worth knowing about. Um, and Andy, do you want to say anything about the support? Andy Mayer speaks off camera, then comes onto screen. That's available on campus, so the student well-being. Yes, services. yes I can. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate what you're saying about friends and me, by all means, link through, if you are a student here, by all means, link through me and I'll link to Sue, where we will talk about setting up the network. Yeah. I'm on the um, uh, Bournemouth University's uh, Student Health and Wellbeing Board. We, got, we are very, very um, passionate about supporting students' mental health and well-being. So uh, in addition to counselling services um, and chaplaincy services and any other help which is actually held in this building, chaplaincy is upstairs along there, we, um, we also have um, services where we can direct you to um, local um, organisations like Steps Wellbeing, which is self referral service, um, and we can also have other ways in which we can make sure that you have the proper links through to mental health. So if you've got any questions, just link through to the Health and Wellbeing Centre here and they'll help you or email me and I will direct you to where you need help. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, to recap then, we've looked at um, the signs and symptoms of depression, the fact that sometimes it can be a surprise to be diagnosed with depression because the symptoms can be quite physical. <coughs> Um, we've looked at some of the statistics um, and, and you know, the real importance of, of being aware of, of, of suicide risk and taking care of people if we're worried about them. And we've talked about the different forms of treatment and support that are available and then we've looked at peer support and the, you know, the, the offer to try and get something going here on the campus for people to get together. Although, you know, we're depression alliance, you don't, you know, we don't turn people away if they've got anxiety or OCD or, uh, you know, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. We don't mind, you know, as long as they kind of identify with the fact that they, they feel depressed from time to time. So um, we're very happy for people to join Friends in Need whether they've been personally affected by depression or whether it's somebody in their family or a friend, 
but it's just really to break down the loneliness and the isolation that often goes with mental health problems and particularly depression I think because you just do withdraw yourself and shut yourself away very easily. So I'm going to finish there. I'm really happy to have been invited to talk to you. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take questions now or talk to you one to one at the end. But um, thank you very much for having me. Screen fades to black with the text. If you would like to find out more about the dignity, diversity, and equality work at the university, please contact Dr. James Palfman K, Equality and Diversity Advisor. Email diversity at bournemouth.ac.uk. www.bournemouth.ac.uk forward slash diversity, followed by the Bournemouth University logo.